Alrighty. Time for better discourse react. So basically how it goes is we've got a bunch of our people that we know in the Twitch politics. We got Jangles, we got um actual Justice Warrior who's a dipshit, we got Destiny, we got all these people who are like um work uh, being present, so this is just kind of like just reviewing what's happening. Tip your servers, engage with your neighbors and panelists on our breaks whenever possible, and for those of you at home, interact with each other and our in-house guests online. But most of all, remember, everybody have fun, keep track of your wristbands, we don't want any miscommunications with that kind of stuff. Uh, three. There are various to have kind of not become that anymore. It may or not be a coincidence that when the platforms gained the peak of their popularity and started to be used for something other than just telling someone, you know, what they were doing at the gym or what they were eating and different things like that, these big tech companies kind of got in the way and said, that's enough of that. The game, their bully purpose to begin with, the haves and the have-nots, the cans and the can'ts. How it starts, in just a bit, blackballed on... Should the tech where that we please welcome <laughs> our speakers? He's been featured in the New York Times and his famous Twitch streamer, Stephen Bonnell. The queen of controversial conversations, Ariel Scorsella. Yeah, that's fine. Or whichever is fine. And worldwide renowned. Oh, she's the the the, the transphobe. Okay. Political shit talker, Nico House. And author, author and video essayist, Peter Coffin. All right, welcome to Better Discourse. I'm your moderator, Brian Edward. And today our panel is uh, Democracy Dies with Dorsey. Um, that's meant to be a little bit funny because some of that censorship is coming from social media. But uh, I, I did hear the quote, when you tear out a man's tongue, you're not proving him a liar. You're only telling the world that you fear what he might say. And that was said by some guy named Tyrion from some show named Game of Thrones. And while we're not in uh, Westeros, we're in the real world. Censorship and... All right, Game of Thrones reference already, I guess. <laughs> and these kind of things are pretty much an issue. And I wanted to start the conversation off by citing the ACLU which may or may not be a defender of uh, civil liberties right now. That could be debated. But it says that there's two fundamental principles that come into play involving free expression. The first is the government cannot limit expression just because any listener or even the majority of a community is offended by its content. But that's balanced by a second principle, that expression may be restricted only if it clearly causes direct and imminent harm to an important social interest. So I wanted to ask some of the panelists, so do you agree with the sentiments of the ACLU here, or do you feel like this second principle is being abused? And if so, how and by whom? And let's start with Ariel. It's a loaded question, right? Because I think all of us, correct me if I'm wrong, all of us have been censored at one point. Maybe not you, because you're a little bit more leaning far left I at the moment. I have absolutely been censored. Have you? Don't okay. Oh, yeah. Well, then, th then it's a problem across the political spectrum, right? I think that, as far as I'm concerned, I've had people come for me, you know, in, in multiple ways, try to, to censor me. And I, even if I disagree with them to the core, I don't think anybody should be censored. And I, I especially don't think any major network should be censoring anybody. I think, if anything, if I have a good enough argument, my argument will win in the long run anyway. Peter. Well, I mean, is it really an ideal or is it a question of institutional power? That's my, that's where I'm always coming from on this. Um, what are you saying? Where is it coming from? Uh, should you be allowed to criticize power? And 
yes, obviously. Are you going to be? That's a, another heavy question. I do think that's probably the kind of stuff that we, I would like to be trying to address here. Nico, where are you at? Oh, this bothers me a lot. The the vi the voice visual is so off, and it's like Jesus Christ. So, a friend of mine, Garland Nixon, used to sit on the board of the ACLU, and he left because he understands that. I mean, that principle is, is just it's wrong. It's unethical. We can't have such a principle when we don't understand all of the agendas that every single uh, powerful institution has. And so where they may convince the public that some speech is or could be dangerous to them, where they're merely just trying to push an ulterior motive that we may not yet be aware of. And I, I, we are just like kind of dancing around whatever we're referring to right now. We're not making any direct statements yet, so that's interesting. We've said time and time and time and time again. And so who's to say what's dangerous? Something could appear dangerous in the short term, but ultimately end up working out in the long term. But at the end of the day, like I feel like everybody who knows me knows I'm a free speech absolutist. And the only way to defeat bad speech is just with more speech and just make sure you know what that I This is the problem is... If speech is linked to certain powerful institutions, like, this is the problem, is we talk about, like, the marketplace ideas, like, like free speech, but then whenever one speech is given more credence, more power over the other, then it's like, what the fuck? How do you, how do you effectively deal with that without some kind of course correction, you know? The hell you're talking about when you address it. Like, that's the way to conquer this, this fear of, what if they say something bad? Bad things could happen. <laughs> will allow speech to flow freely, and I guarantee you problems will begin to solve themselves. That, yeah, can I just p piggyback on that point? Because this is one thing an ex-girlfriend said. Of th the only thing I got from that relationship was this point. <laughs> and she said that no matter what somebody says, we should allow them to say it because people are thinking it anyway. And when you allow them to say it publicly, you also allow people to be aware that they're saying possibly something that's incorrect, and then you can correct them on it. But you wouldn't be able to correct them if you didn't if they didn't have the opportunity to say it in the first place. Destiny, what do you think? I think that the First Amendment is important. I think it's beautiful. I think it's well worded, and I think freedom of speech as a concept is something that should be defended. But I think oftentimes people misapply it to private platforms like Twitter and Facebook, and they try to take these arguments about whether or not the government should abridge our freedom of speech, which it shouldn't, um, except in certain dire cases, um, like yelling fire in a crowded theater or the spreading of like, child pornography or something, of course, which I think we all agree with. But I think that applying those same arguments to private institutions actually, in a way, becomes an anti-First Amendment argument. So I do agree that the First Amendment is important insofar as it applies to the government, but those principles shouldn't carry forward to every single private platform that we engage in, because one of your freedoms as an owner of a private platform is to determine what type of content do I want posted on this particular platform. But what if that platform has become a monopoly? I think that's a good argument to, to combat that point, too. I mean, if a, if a platform has become a monopoly, then we can talk about antitrust laws, we can talk about things like this, but you, you cannot enforce a platform to just have all content on it. It's, just, I, I, so it's an anti-First Amendment argument. I mean, if we, it's... I, I'm still trying to understand. Why do people keep pretending as if Facebook is a private platform? Like, it's, it's well, not. It's a definition it's of not. They literally it's have not. former CIA agents working within Facebook. Facebook goes into Congress. Wait, just because it has a former... C oh, God. What the fuck is this? You know, comes up with a bunch of nonsense after they get accused of something, and somehow, some way, they always end up coming out on top. In fact, it is literally a law that is allowing them to act as, like, as arbiters of truthful or false information... Be, like because of a law that it's, it's protecting them. And so whenever anyone goes to try and change it, they are the ones who have the money to then influence politicians, not that they even have to, but they have the money to influence politicians to make sure that that law that they are- This is the problem that comes back into lobbying efforts is you'd have to demonstrate that their lobbying efforts are directly in creating these mechanisms and institutions. And it's really hard to argue that because there's not any direct evidence. It's always usually some kind of like gesturing like vaguely to other aspects of it. So it's like really difficult to make those arguments. Benefit Benefiting from continues to allow them to then influence the outcome of elections in one form or another. At the end of the day, 
when they constantly act on behalf of the government, uh, especially when it seems that there is a partisan agenda involved, when they go to the government and get exactly what they want, they're not being held accountable like other private institutions have been held accountable. At what point do we stop pretending that words mean, they, like th th that private and public mean whatever they say it means when they're clearly acting as a public arm of the government? So, the, I mean, that's a conversation we get into. So private means not government. It means privately owned. Facebook is a privately owned company. It's not owned by the government. Uh, if you want to have a conversation about whether or not Section 230 should, should be built, picture. which it shouldn't That's be, cool. um, if you want to have a conversation about whether or not platforms should be allowed to moderate their content, which they absolutely should be, if you want to have a conversation about whether or not you should be allowed to lobby the government, I think most of us agree you probably should be to some limited extent. Those are all great, great conversations to have. But the idea that just because a private company lobbies the government, they're somehow not Are private. you familiar with In Incutel? Do you know what Incutel is? Do I, don't need a The CIA's venture capitalist firm in Arlington, Virginia? The, what, basically... What? There's a, I can go through the, the whole way they did it, but basically Peter Thiel and Ingutel invested into Facebook. That's how Facebook became what it was and overtook MySpace. Wait, wait, what? Peter, Peter Thiel and Facebook? Co-founder PayPal, he was first outside investor in Facebook. He was ranked number four. Moved to Sony to governs. Should public speech online or offline be treated differently? Um, like public speech, um, like. What do you mean? Um, if it's online, it's easily through like a private platform. But if you're doing like if you're a if you're person on your own, I think it is treated differently. Like, um, I think that's just true. Like, um, if you're if you're outside and you're just like going going on your own way in a bar, if they said all the same things as were in a thread online. Um, it depends on the thread because I think the type of thread uh, is important for the, the response you have because just because you have the ability to have say things doesn't mean you can't get like punched you know feel Uh, I have no idea what he's referring this to. This is a thing that we've seen Incutel do because they have unlimited give funding second, sources. Another example I can give you is... Some of the stuff online aren't actually is... coming from people's mouths. They are copied electrically and reproduced in something similar to junk mail. Okay, well, you can talk about the issues of, like, robots and stuff online, but that doesn't mean, like, that's it's not a person saying it. You have, like, no, like, way to, like, say it is. And if it's a robot saying it, then, we, then you figure out it's a robot, you can get rid of it, right? You can do that. Now, you can talk about, like, how the overuse of robots, how it's easier to form robots and everything. Like, sure, you could talk about that. But that doesn't mean you have to, like, tra change the speech rules or whatever. I don't understand. How Google came out of nowhere and overtook Yahoo. It's because Incutel had unlimited money to ensure that Google was able to overtake Yahoo. That's how Amazon went from being a failed business platform, a failed business model, and eBay was destroying them. And then out of nowhere, where Jeff Bezos inexplicably becomes the most wealthy man in the world. That's how Tesla was a failed business, relying only and exclusively on our subsidies. And then now, Elon Musk so is the almost, most successful man, successful man in the world. Yeah, so, so my point is, the reason Facebook is, has hit the peak that it's hit is because of the government. So even though it's private, it's just, a, it's just once again, it's just another way to rebrand public. But they just don't call it that. Beyond if, if you that, want, if you want to have a conversation about whether or not some subsidy for electric vehicles should be repealed, if you want to have a conversation, bots are usually booted and found because they aren't a human posting. Yeah, so that doesn't make any sense to me. Then conversation about whether some people should be allowed to privately invest in a company. No, no, no. I just said the government have, literally the created problem a. Is, the problem the, a, is, is a government. No, no, no. Because you're doing no, no, no. Destiny, Destiny. What we're not going to do today? So here's what we're not going to do today. You're not going to try to poke holes about shit that nobody's talking about. I said the government had their venture capitalist firm. Invest right? in a private company where no one else could compete. 
I That's what we're talking about. When, when, you say, when you say something along, along the lines of like, how did Amazon, Jeff Bezos became a I didn't millionaire say how. overnight? I didn't say how. I gave you the reason as to why. I didn't say how. I didn't ask how. It's because I everybody in this happened. room probably uses Amazon Prime. Everybody in this room probably buys shit off Amazon. Everybody in this room probably uses Amazon Video. Like, we know why these companies become huge, because they offer That's products that everybody in society uses. No, no, I just... If you want to talk about repealing an individual law, if you want to talk about repealing it... Thank you for the follow. That individual law. Please tell if me you want to talk about company repealing an that can compete law, with unlimited funding from the government. You, you, you can. You, nobody's getting unlimited funding from the government. I just told you. Do you you're, look you're talking to me can, about specific you, subsidies I, that exist so, for these companies. Okay, you so want to argue? You gotta go to the next question. Or you gotta go to the next question. Okay. Let's figure it out. All right, you're, right, you're, right. You're, One second. Let me cut in. Let, let's hear from the Marxists. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. See, the purpose of the state is to uphold class relations, right? Go on. Yeah. So. That's it. That's it. I'm of the a moderator. Joke. I'm that's not allowed to be Marxist. Anyway. Right. Um, the purpose of the state. So, that's the it. That's it. I'm of the a moderator. Joke. I'm that's not allowed to be Marxist. Anyway. Um, the purpose of the state is to uphold class relations. A fundamental difference between two classes owner, not owner. Right? Facebook is owner. They benefit from all the action that the state. All right. Uh, so. Peter Coffin, he's Marxist, whatever, cool. And I'm like, okay, so we can understand power dynamics and everything. But the problem comes is as we can understand how they have, like, power there, but then we don't understand, like, how we don't reinforce it necessarily. And that's the problem in the power leadership here, right? Is we can talk about how, like, feel, I don't even know, man. Like, I'd have to look that up. It's like, this is more complicated than just power relationships. Oh, it is power relationships, but, like, it's more complicated than just, like, Facebook versus, like, normal people, you know? It does. Ultimately, I, I'm going to have to side with Nico on this. Like, it's it's going to be either through state subsidies, either through investment, either through any of that, uh, that Facebook gains its dominance, that Amazon gains its dominance. Again, it was just a dumb bookstore in the 1990s that was nearing the, uh, if you remember, the dot-com bubble. That was, that was they were going to go down with that. Why didn't they? That's a, in my opinion, that's really the question here. Uh, it's 100%. Yeah, I, I'm just basically with you on this. Like the only way you can invest in the SpaceX is to buy stocks in Google. And SpaceX is literally basically owned by the Pentagon now. So like, that's what? Where is he getting this from? He's literally pulling this out of nowhere. A coincidence? So, so is, your <laughs> argument, is your argument that because government has undue influences over these social media entities, that therefore they're obstructing free speech, but not directly through law, but indirectly through company policy. Yeah, where well, they don't have to be held accountable for what they do. They're, they're, how, what do you mean by that? They don't have to be held accountable. Be, the government can't be held accountable for something, because people like Destiny are going to come up here and make an argument saying, no, yeah, that's just... Yeah, so, like, I can understand how there's a power differential here, right? Is, like, these monopolies exist, and these can, these do lead to a lot of problems. But the problem comes here right now in the analysis as if it's just like, oh, like, just like hand waving, it's just all a big problem, right? Is like, we don't understand how, like, consumers don't necessarily reinforce that, right? That's the relationship here is we can be given the product, we can be given a lot of undue influence to consume that product, but ultimately we do consume that product, we choose to consume that product, either by convenience or circumstance or whatever. So it's the problem in the relationship, it's like, it's back and forth, like, it's a feedback loop, right? We can understand how both of these are important here. And like, the problem comes here right now uh, with this guy in the red pants, is like we don't understand i don't know like he's making a lot of like gestures and points that aren't necessarily coherent right he's making saying a lot of things that but not giving it a lot of any like coherent argument the private company that's not the government doing that yeah the government is literally letting them skate at every at every turn no matter how much information gets put on them no matter how much people find out they're using their monopoly to influence the outcome of politics and but when we go and try to hold anybody accountable the government just ultimately gives facebook what they want again and then facebook like just starts the metaverse and so the, the reason why, why nobody is held accountable is because at the end of the day all we do is we go online and we shit post about how horrible these companies are but you can't actually point to a piece of legislation that you'd want repealed. You can't point to like some actual. We could literally just taken. reform 230. You can't, you can't. If you want to talk about 230, you can't. Repealing 230 would lead to an. I didn't say re uh, Okay, so I didn't say repeal. We talk about reforming 230. Reforming 230. Reform 230. Sure, you can reform 230. That's probably going to destroy every single new website that would. Ever Why would it do that? When 230. Protection for private blocking screening offensive material. Uh, the Congress finds following rapid developing array of internet and other interactive computer services available to individual. 
uh, represent an extraordinary advance in availability. He services users. Okay. What? I don't understand. Why you can just, just reform it and make sure it doesn't do that. Okay, how, how, would you, how, would you want to how would you want to reform PMP in this game oh, where you, you hyperbolize you want. It doesn't make you any smarter. It doesn't make your point any more correct. How do you want to reform security? Because you don't like the fact that it destroys your argument. Tell us how you want to reform security. Like I said reform. How? We can talk about how the reform should look, but it's not going to destroy all future websites. Tell us how you want to reform 230. You're being ridiculous. Give me a sample reform. Give me a sample reform. You're being ridiculous, bro. Come on. No, no, I ask her. I want to know a sample reform of 230. Ariel whispered to me that we should express what Section 230 is. So it's, it's, quote, no provider or use of an interactive computer service shall be treated as the publisher or speaker of any information provided by another information content provider. Yeah, I had to look that up, by the way. I didn't know what that was. So, mm -hmm. like, I'm glad that you said it for people that also don't know what that was. Yeah, my bad. So that was. That, that's Section 230, which gives them certain immunities, right? So, the, so the what, is it, what is the 230 reform that we're looking for? As long as so how do you want to change it? Do you want to repeal it, or how, we, how should oh, we you alter 230? You would reform it to make, ex like, to make exceptions in cases like, for, like Facebook, for example, well, the where they're is, acting as publishers, but Facebook then you got to hold. So then you allow people to sue them as if you were suing a CNN or an MSNBC or Fox News. Currently, you cannot. That's the problem. How is it the pro so the entire backbone of the internet from IRC chats to bulletin message boards in the 80s to to all, to GeoCities websites in the 2000s. The only reason why websites can exist is because they require an immunity from being sued if they have user generated content on their platform. No, 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 no they're private you don't companies. Want the, can I finish one sentence? Holy shit. Okay. They're, you they're don't want it so though. that anytime somebody posts something on your website, you can get sued for what another user uploads no, on your that, site. If no, 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 that no, no, is no. the case, that's not what if we're that talking is about. the case, that absolutely is. You're just evict these fake there, realities there's a in your why, head. There's a reason we're not, why no, nobody, we're talking about you're Facebook just, you're just being held over over accountable over for removing right. people's content, destroying people's businesses, destroying people's brands. You're talking about random shit posting. Nobody is talking about reforming 230. It's a little bit loud and echoey. 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 Reforming 230 would destroy anybody's ability to start any new internet website where you have user-generated content because as soon as you can hold a website liable for what users are posting, just because what, you want to engage in moderation? Should you not be allowed to moderate your communities? If you yeah, want to make a message board for right-leaning people or thing. for feminists, do you not have the ability to moderate your communities? Way? Of course you should be able to do that without being held liable as publisher or something of information. And these websites, just because they though. engage in moderation, doesn't make them a publisher. That's ridiculous. To try to say that because somebody puts up a fact check or because somebody puts up a, or ban certain types of content, they become all of a sudden a publisher of information. What do you think it means to publish something? When you're getting fun, something? when you're, oh, go, go ahead, go ahead. yeah, I, I think here's a problem though. They're not just a neutral like platform. They don't have to be neutral. Oh, where really? Yes, really, yeah. Yes, of okay. course. Yes. So let's hear, let's hear why they don't have to be neutral. Because that's the law. You're not required. You're not obligated. There is no fa that. We just talked about the First Amendment. If you started a private platform where you brought people on to speak, do you think that the First Amendment means that you have to let every single person come on? That's a violation no. of your First Amendment rights. If I start a forum and I want to talk about how cool dogs are, am I legally obligated to let cat lovers come and shit my forum up with how, how great their animal? Like, it doesn't make any sense. Like, you, of course you, be, you don't have to be a neutral platform. Do you think Fox News is a neutral platform? Do you think no, CNN is a neutral platform? No, you, you can don't have sue to be Fox a neutral platform. You can CNN. sue Fox News you can literally for sue things them. that are said on Fox News. If they News. lie, because you can sue them. If they defame you, you can sue them. If you, they slander you, you can sue them. That's the difference. When yes, Facebook exactly. takes some, I'll give you an example of consequences. So recently, in <sighs> okay, okay, this is the stupid, stupid in the argument is Fox News publishes its own information. Facebook is just simply like a a platform for people to put in put posts and information it's different it's not the same thing like everybody can recognize that right texas actually so if it's different you're going to treat it differently 16 years old the son was when he, he posted gofundme to pay for the funeral gofundme removes him you don't have a constitutional that, pause, right to post pause, GoFundMe. Pause. i'm sorry because of that obviously it becomes much more difficult to fundraise for that funeral now, why did they remove him? Like, it's a literal fact that the vaccine caused this man's son's death. Okay. All right. Okay. This man. This man right here. Alrighty. Alrighty. Cool. Alrighty. Alrighty. Fool. Yep. He's an idiot. He is unironically a dumb fuck. 
but they're saying because of spreading <laughs> vaccine misinformation that he can't fundraise there because then, of course, we bring attention to the fact that there might be side effects. Like, Facebook removed people for saying that hydroxychloroquine was a legitimate solution, or at least to help while we're waiting for vaccines when it came to COVID, and then people got, doctors were banned. People died, fucking destiny, people died. Are you, are you people, gonna, wait, no, oh, first of all. No, what I'm telling you is let that let there, are, there are real consequences when you are removing people because you're pretending to be an arbiter of information when you're literally removing experts. It's one thing if you moderate the content by saying this isn't allowed, you give them a strike. But if you think that they should be removed, then you go through the fucking court of law and you hold them accountable there. And if someone has decided that you are overtly or accidentally causing problems that could lead to mass conflict or violence or whatever, then you allow the okay. courts to settle it. But what you're suggesting is that we should allow this entity that has gotten unlimited funding from the government they don't. That, where you can't, to okay, the point where now you can no what? longer actually have competition against them. All right, Nico, let's, 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 let's hear a rebuttal okay, now. So Go everything ahead. about hydroxychloroquine has been proven to be ineffective. Bullshit. The fact See, that you would bring that up. Can I, can I finish? Wait, can I finish? Can I finish? Bullshit. Are you going to scream over me every time I start counting the bullshit you said here? I, I need like 10 minutes to go through every fucking stupid thing you just go said. Go ahead. Go ahead. One. So number one, hydroxychloroquine is like the worst example of anything you brought up of. Okay, number one. Number two, if a private platform wants to ban somebody from the community for any reason, they're allowed to do that. You do not have a constitutional right to post on fucking GoFundMe. Just like any person in this audience doesn't have a constitutional right to come up on the, don't, right. I know you want to talk. Nobody I'm in back. this audience has a constitutional Let's right to come up here and grab a micro and scream at somebody. That's part of your First Amendment privilege. If you start a platform, How are if those you two start things a analogous? platform, you are, How allowed are those to two moderate things analogous? you are allowed to moderate that content in any way that you see fit. The idea am I, that you are am obligated, I money the idea that you are obligated, the am idea am that you are obligated, the idea that you are obligated to hold Post all forms of content on your website is a delusional fantasy. I don't know where it came from. I don't know where people got this idea from. There's no case law that supports this. There's no legislation that supports this. There's no constitutional amendment that supports this. It is absolute delusion. No, 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 no. There's literally a law this, okay? that says so if, if you anybody act wants as a to, public, right, you can't come me up 30 you, times okay, after talking to whole bunch for like five minutes. I, I, so yeah, I okay, hold on, wait, can I finish responding? Yeah. Holy shit, yeah. So if a, if a website decides that they want to moderate their content in the way that they see fit, if they want to ban doctors, if they want to ban experts, if they don't want you to do your whatever fucking GoFundMe, that's completely and totally within their right to do so. And just because they not they don't want to host your content doesn't mean you can go cry to the federal government and say, I have a right, I have a constitutional right to this platform. That's an pause. insane reading of how the First Amendment pause, works. Pause, pause, pause. pause. We're not pause talking about the First Amendment. We're talking about, the, we're talking about, the okay, we're so talking about talk, that's literally Section 230 protects you only if only and exclusively if you're not behaving as a publisher. So another Bingo. great example would be the Hunter Biden situation where every single time a Hunter Biden article would come out, people were getting banned. People were literally so losing So like you mean Twitter, Twitter business. stopping the link to the Twi Oh, not just Twitter, article. Facebook, Twitter. My friend got banned from Facebook for seven days. Another one of my friends got removed for, just for moderating an article from mainstream media about Biden on Facebook with no context. Banned. Now, all of a sudden, you're banning people because, not because the information is wrong, just because you don't like what's being put out there. Now, that's what we call editing. That is editorial. That is publishing, which means you should why be able to be, Twitter? pause. You should be able to be held accountable, but you cannot be. Because why, you're did, why, did ban, why did Twitter ban the Hunter Biden article? Motherfucker, please explain it to me, because we would love to know. Uh, no, uh, wait, you brought it up, so you should know Why about did they it. So ban tell me. You tell me. We, we're literally trying to find out. Go ahead. No, we're not trying. It's public information, so you don't know. Why, why, why I hear you it? say, I have no fucking idea why Twitter banned You don't even know which Twitter. article I'm referring to right now, exactly but go ahead. I, I know exactly Exa what you're referring uh, to. Which one? So tell me. You tell me. You brought it no, up No, no, no. You just said you know exactly what it is. Go ahead. Why are you trying to posture right now? You brought up the example. You just literally cut me off to ask. You just said you know the answer. You know the reason why. you don't know why I'm telling you, if you know why it was banned, please explain. I will explain. All right. Let me, let me, let me. Wait, so Twitter has a specific policy for hacked materials where if you upload something on, if you upload It literally wasn't hacked. If you up, did Hunter Biden approve of those images and everything from the laptop being posted? It wasn't hacked. And it's a hacked material. It literally wasn't hacked. So Twitter has also banned people on the left. You're just going to keep talking to me like that makes you correct? You got it, you got it. I'm right here, dude. You don't have to look it's at the audience. Hey, 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 talk they to me. They handed it over here. The they were like, hey, post this. Hey, hey, 
New York Times I, is New York Times banned for posting hacked Let him cereal? rebut, and then we're getting to the next question. I'm, I'm, question. Right, I'm right here. I don't know. I don't know who you're looking the at. New York Times Are you talking to somebody for, else right now? I'm trying to understand. Are you lost? I wasn't about going to answer I, my I, question. I think this guy's lost. Is, like is, is the somewhere? New York Times banned for posting hacked materials? Because last time I checked, they did it all the time. But Nico, we get the point. You got to You got to let me respond. But that's but that's my point. I'm right here. Hey, you are not understanding the lack of consistency. I understand completely. That's you the just issue. had no idea You're telling what me what the rule there is, but they won't explain why they don't consistently follow the fucking rule. Because That's one, the problem. Is anyone all right, this is glorious. This is some goddamn blood sports. All right, all right. What is legally defined as hacked material? So, use of hacks and hacking to exfiltrate information for private computer systems can be used to manipulate the public conversation and make us all less secure online. What is it in violation of this policy? Uh, we define a hack as an intrusion or access computer network or electronic that's unauthorized, unauthorized and exceeded authorized access behaviors associated with the production materials, which would include account access or interception or access that exceeds authorization, disclosing materials accessed legitimately outside of approved. Disclosing materials where there is evidence that they are obtained through malware or social engineering. Okay. So, like, yeah, the hood and biter. You wanted the to audience discuss, have a Xanax. If you wanted to discuss the Hunter Biden story or post the Hunter Biden story, you were absolutely allowed to as long as you didn't link to a website that had hacked materials listed on it. Number one, and I know that because I discussed it on Twitter and I get banned. Number one, okay? Number two, there have been, there was a left-leaning group that leaked a whole bunch of, like, police materials. Part of the big ACAB thing. I think it was, like, a year prior, and they got banned for doing the exact same type of thing. This particular story is not a story of political bias. It's a story where you, who has a clear political narrative, has taken one story, completely misrepresented it, and then try to pretend that it supports is your side of the political narrative. Is New York Times banned exactly for posting hack material? If you put, if okay, so the answer is yes or no question. Yes, yes, if you post. No, they're not. They post WikiLeaks leaked material. They have not been banned. What are you talking about? If you CNN are, did it. Hey, then Trump Nico, taxes you, just get leaked and it got posted. I'm right here. Those are hack materials, I'm right correct? Here. I'm right here. Okay, that's what I thought. I'm right here. So the problem isn't that they are they are taking their right to 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 enforce their rules. What we're trying to figure out is why are you inconsistently forcing rules? What do you do when those rules are being forced inconsistently and they're supporting a certain political agenda while undermining another, and then at that point, when does that not make you a publisher? And if it does make you a publisher, why can you not be held to the same level of okay, hey, Nico, as an actual what? publisher? Let's it's very this. simple. Let's attack this from a slightly different angle. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go and ask Ariel what she thinks of this. So in 2019, Cedric Richmond, um, U.S. congressman from Louisiana, warned Facebook and Google that they had better restrict what he and his colleagues saw as harmful content or face regulation. Quote, he said, we're going to make it swift. We're going to make it strong. We're going to hold them accountable. Figure it out because you don't want us to figure it out for you. And Jerry Nadler added to that, let's just see what happens if I pressure them. Is this worrying to you that, that the people that are governing their content moderation are influenced by congressmen? Ariel, what, what do you think? Is that, is that like a skirt around the First Amendment or what, what's your thoughts? I think that anybody that has power is, is going to try to control more. That's just the fact, right? That, that, that happens throughout history. It worries me when people use that power to silence people. Oh, God. They don't understand fucking anything, okay? Seriously, I'm a fucking anarchist. And what is this, man? Like, like, uh, oh, God. It's institutions of power make it easier for abuse it doesn't mean they're always going to abuse it right it doesn't mean always it just means like behaviors may be pro may result in like outcomes of abuse instead of outputs like they're not directly trying to abuse maybe it just like results in problems people like that's like the part that's the, the concept of this panel right yeah i think that i do agree partially with, with what he's saying i understand where he's coming from with, with Steven, and I think that if you do have your own platform, yes, you can moderate content in a way because, yeah, because if there's like pornography or something, you don't want mm -hmm. that, yes. But I also think people are taking that to the extreme and making it political, and just it, because they don't like something, you know, they're, they're you removing feel that. that. Like, I, don't, I don't think that's a healthy way for this country to be going. Do you going. feel like the, the, the government has an undue like influence on like what, what Facebook is doing? Oh, yeah, I do. I think. Uh, this is just me personally, but I, I think. Do you have an example of that? I think that it's pretty, it's fairly obvious to me that Facebook ha has some kind of 
secret agreement, whatever, I don't know, <laughs> with the Democratic Party. Oh, God. Oh, because dumb. even, and YouTube too, I don't mean, like I speak from personal experience. I know that until I came out, like I was posting the same content for 10 years on YouTube, sexual, sexual education. Until I came out as leaving the left and being like a non-leftist, then they started banning me and, and, and restricting me. So to me, that's my experience of what you're saying. And I don't think, obviously, I'm biased. Anyway, but I'm maybe you should stop being a turf. I don't know. Maybe you should stop doing that. Mm, you know, maybe you should stop doing that. Maybe, like, you didn't leave the left. You were just saying some shitty stuff. And then you got, like, roasted and shit. And you didn't like that. And you're like, oh, they're being mean to me. I don't think what that's was okay. the reason? Did they say that you were causing harm? I mean, is it the they, second They said principle? it was because of my sexually explicit content, but I've been posting that same content for 10 years. So to me, it's like, okay, they don't like what I'm saying now. Okay. What, what about but, you, but, Steven? But yeah, I do think it's because th that's, to, to me, it's, it's too obvious. It was too obvious to me that this is why it was happening. Right. So, uh, Steven, what do you think? Like, if, if, it, if there's a link between, like, the government like in, in senators pushing these guys is that does that not apply isn't that like the the government using you know abridging the first amendment in the wrong way i mean i think it would depend on what they're pushing for or what like the implication is if the implication is that if this behavior is going on that leads to some sort of harm and we're going to like legislate a new law or we're going to like enforce a law in the book about it that's a that's probably fine that's what congress <laughs> is there for um but if it's something like we're pressuring you to like censor certain political narratives yeah. or whatever then that's probably not okay um i will say though again a platform has the right even if they want to ban you know like republicans or democrats on their platform it's within their right to do so as a social media platform Platform. Yeah, now, and I, I agree with I agree with you. Sure. I don't think it's good, but I think that by law they should be able to. Sure. I don't and think, I, and I, don't I, think and I agree one hundred percent with that. I don't I think, think it's a good thing for the country. Of, like, though. Depending on the platform, censoring of like conservative speech or whatever online, it sucks because it makes it more boring for me. Because I like to shout at people, <laughs> and I don't have as many people shout out. Do you think two thirty is fine <laughs> the way it is? You, do you think two thirty is fine the way it is? You no changes. I don't think 230 is fine. I think 230 is essential for the internet to function the way that it does. Without 230 written as is, you it, you lose, like the, the 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 new world going forward is every single platform would have to moderate every single comment posted, knowing that they might get in trouble for like the reason why 230 came about was that when when um when certain platforms were moderating their content, the idea was that well hold on if you're going to ban some stuff and not other stuff, you're basically it, tacitly approving of other stuff that's being posted so we can sue you for that. And so people were starting to take websites to court stuff that their users had posted on the site. Yeah. If I posted defamatory content of anybody on this stage, you shouldn't be able to sue the platform that I posted on. You should sue me for it. Right? That's the essential protection that 230 provides so that websites can continue to exist while allowing user-generated content to flourish on their sites. Well, the difference between the two things is whether it's a provider or a publisher. And there are a lot of things that Facebook does that make it a publisher. It is not specifically just a provider. The algorithmic way that they sort content, they prioritize certain types of content, they push certain types of content, and it, 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 whether it's because of a political agenda or because it's the content that makes them more money, and I understand that that's probably something that is built in it is going to be a contradiction that you're not going to be able well so the curious question here is we can understand how like algorithms work and they drive like content but the question that comes is whether or not like um it's the infrastructure purposely doing that or is like responding to different forces right if you respond to different large uh, scale like um mar uh, large scale people then it's going to be different there so like that's the problem here is whether the infrastructure is the thing doing it or it's simply responding to like the uh the different um informational force source forces able to uh get rid of anytime soon but in a lot of cases facebook is acting as a publisher rather than a provider so this is just not true so people have tried How? to stretch well, i'm about to answer that so People have tried to stretch this idea that if you have an algorithm that shows certain information, or if you do like a fact check, or if you moderate certain content, that this makes you a publisher. It is very clear, like a publisher is somebody that publishes information. So if Facebook were to start writing articles, or if Twitter were to start writing articles and they were pushing these or whatever, then those 230 live... Those What's an op-ed page? What? What is an op-ed page in a newspaper? Does New York Times, like Mr. New York Times, write everything there? Or do other people do it? And, and op-ed page, my understanding is that on that, 
you would be liable for that, but that's because you're publishing what's on the op-ed page. You're like approaching a writer and you're saying, we're going to hire you or pay you for this like op-ed and we're gonna publish it in our magazine. Now, Hiring Twitter, and paying is irrelevant. If, if Twitter, if Twitter, paying is essential. It might be no, essential, it is not. What we're talking. It, if Twitter, Absolutely not. Do you understand that there is a difference between a newspaper that solicits op-eds from people versus a platform where any user more or less well, can sign up and generate about, content? He said hiring and pay is irrelevant. <laughs> Yeah, what hiring and pay is irrelevant. And, and Facebook is soliciting it's, 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 it's content it's not, from us, sorting like, it and putting it out based on their own preferences. An may algorithm. May I, Sorry. Daily Coast, for example, you didn't have to be a high, it's like a blog. It was just a very sophisticated blog before. I do think it's kind of weird that um, Peter Coffin, the, the communist, is like associating with the fucking anti vaxxer. <laughs> Holy shit. It's like, okay, dude, chill out. You know, like, what the fuck? It became what it became. So, like, no, hiring pay is relevant, but Daily Coast could still be sued. Huh? Yeah? You see the difference? What, what, my understanding is you, that you if you have a website though. where any person can just submit content willy-nilly, if it's like a, some WordPress site, some blog or whatever, like Medium, for instance, you can't sue Medium for somebody that writes an article on Medium because Medium is not like the publisher. It's just a distribution platform for that article. Now, yeah, even if you've got, even if you've got an algorithm that sorts stuff, exactly. like you might like this, you might like that, or even if you ban stuff like we don't want this, we don't like that, that still doesn't make them a publisher of the information. But They're see, just a content distribution network. Does it's it a change? CDN that somebody uses for user-generated content to show up on their website. The, the, the content all comes from people Is there not a, endemic to the company. So, well, we don't know if Medium could be sued. Maybe they could. We don't know. Like, honestly, we... Wait, we don't know what? I couldn't we don't know if Medium can or can't be sued. No one has ever attempted to because we they do don't know because arbitrarily... They don't arbitrarily remove people's information just because it doesn't agree with a certain political agenda, to my knowledge. I've never heard any complaints uh, about Removing that. information that doesn't However, agree with political agenda... However... Doesn't Destiny, mean you lose your let section me finish talking, Mr. Oh my I don't God, think I you've let me finish a single thing, so I, I have talking. very little sympathy for you at this Look, point. Bro, right, what, what do you want to say, Let me Nico? finish talking. I'll just let you pontificate for a fucking hour as usual. Let me oh, talk. Oh, yeah, one hour, man. What do you anyway. Want to say? Who the so, fuck is this guy, honestly? This guy's dumb. He's fucking stupid. Okay, so this is just basically how this is going. And my man who just hit 150,000 subscribers, Shh, the Sean Fitzgerald. Shh, just the 90s. These are it's daily. Jack Posobiec. Jack Posobiec. Just Jack Poslobic. Alt right, alt life, and internet trolls, best known for his prick troll. Ah, Jesus Christ. What the fuck are those sunglasses? Exactly. <laughs> These are OGs. These aren't Vipers. What? These are OGs. Please. These aren't Vipers. My brother found them in my parents' closet. We've had them since the 90s. <laughs> Welcome back to the stage, Stephen Bonnell. <laughs> and my man who just hit 150,000 and news and why it matters from blaze tv sarah gonzalez sarah gonzalez Sarah, I feel like your shoes need their own introduction. What I was hoping that NASA could see them from space when I was walking here. It was my I think goal. you're giving Nico a run for his money. You know, someone's got to do it, so. Well, thank you guys for being with us here today. Um, I wanted to start off by saying something that I think is probably obvious to anyone who's at this 
conference, America is in the midst of an identity crisis. Vanity Fair recently described the controversy surrounding the 1619 Project, for example, as, quote, a fight over who will tell the story of this country and how we think of its identity. It seems as if we are to find any common ground, we might first start by seeing if we can even agree on what is our national story, what does it mean to be an American, uh, what are our country's founding principles? Going on with his head. And should they be seen as a source of unity or a source of division? Jack, if you like to start. Wow, okay. Um, you know, it's, it's weird kind of thinking about the sort of like national identity stuff and national narrative because it feels like every day when, you know, you're sort of in the front lines of, you know, news or breaking news or, you know, cases like Sean covers, you know, so many... Um, criminal cases that are going on that because we've sort of merged the mm. that does make me concerned that he knows about him that he cares about him in some way mm. that is a little concerning essence really of what our national ideas are what our conceptions are what we think of as hey, important versus just this sort of like dissembling of identity right in america and i think that's the real crisis is oh it's the sunglasses oh god the sunglasses are just bothering me it's the national identity and somewhere along the line through you know a lot of deconstructivist thinking and really also through commercialization and you know hyper commercialization hyper individualism where you know have people that instead of identifying as maybe you know in the past they might have said well you know i'm an american but i'm also uh you know, we were just talking backstage, a Bostonian, you know, or a New Yorker, or, you know, from, I'm, I'm originally from the Philly area, so, like, you're an Eagles fan, right? You know, and it just is what it is. And, of course, I'm saying that in Dallas, and my dad Yeah, said, that's brave. My dad, of course, said he would give me 20 bucks if I said that while I was in <laughs> Dallas, so, Dad, you owe me. Um, but, right, we had these sort of identities, or, you know, maybe a religious identity, you know, you're Catholic and all this, but it somewhere along the line we started adding identities and we added more and more and more and more and now Oops. it seems like those new identities you know oh you know what shows do you watch are you a marvel fan are you a disney fan are you this are you that what political team are you on well i'm this i'm that and so you then start to identify as this label that you put yourself on and it used to be that some of those identities were at least rooted under the you know sort of like umbrella identity of being an American, being an American citizen, what that meant, but it somewhere along the line, probably since the 90s, I feel like it's actually changed and we're taking the newer identities and sort of forgetting about the older stuff. To double up on what he's saying, the phenomenon that you're referring to is actually called neo-medievalism, uh, and it, it was like first written about in a book, or I first heard about it in a book, called The Modern Mercenary, and it was talking about the impact of this on the battlefield because we're relying more and more on contractors. And if you guys know your medieval history, like you would, as as a member of society, you would swear... Neo-medieval? What? Okay. Just because you cite something that sounds something vaguely academic doesn't mean it's, like, real, you know? This is so... It's still, like, really annoying. Allegiance to a lord. And, like, this is the problem, is, like, when we think about, like, the American identity, right, we can conceive some idea of it, but it doesn't mean it's necessarily real, right? We can have an idea of something, right? I can have, <coughs> I, I can have an idea of, like, like, you can have an idea of, like, white people. Like, you say, oh, there's white skin, or maybe they eat this kind of food, or, like, whatever. But then you're like, okay, well, if, like, people don't fit within, like, that, but they're, like, they have white skin, are they, like, white? Are they less white? And it's, like, that's the problem, is, like, that dynamic, right? It's, like... These ideas, these identities that we create aren't necessarily, like, real in a sense because we create them and then we, like, formate them and, like, all that stuff. And it's complicated, right? It's like we get taught that these concepts are real, but we don't necessarily mean that they are real, you know? Like, that's the problem in the relationship. Lord, a king, and you would also have a faith, and it's like, what happens when your lord is in conflict with your king? or in conflict with your faith. This would produce problems and contradictions that can rip societies apart. And we're seeing that not only overseas with our contractors, hmm? where we have people who are loyal to companies, their uh, own nation state, their own faith, down, but we're also uh, seeing that like in the, the United garage. States, like all this like over-identifying and identifying with things that are in conflict with one another 
it's bound to create these negative consequences. Because again, if you're if you're identifying as something that is in conflict with like an American vision, hell, you could even make the argument maybe they did have an American identity back then. But because we've globalized so much, we have so many more connections that the the necessity of a national identity decreases, right? Like, even, like, if we do have a national identity, who says, why why do we need it nowadays? And, like, that's the problem. It's like, you know, I have partners, I have relationships, I have friendships all over the fucking world. <sighs> Give me a second. Or in conflict with somebody else, what, or you have multiple contradicting identities, what happens when those conflicts are brought to the forefront? And I think that's what we're seeing in our society right now. Uh, I, if I could, I would also just like to add too, um, I think just as people, as humans, we are tribalistic, right? Like if we look at our ancestors, we were all tribal. And so we have to have this common purpose, this common sense of identity, this common goal. And I think I would agree uh, that we've completely lost uh, sight of what that goal is. And I just think even if you look at uh, in, the, in society, even if you look at a smaller subset of people, you look at a family, what happens to a family, a husband and a wife, a husband and a wife and children who disagree on what the, their common principles are, who disagree on what their common goals are, does that family stay together? Absolutely not. And so I think that when you're looking at, you know, how America has really shifted and we've got these new ideas now, which isn't a surprise because of the indoctrination that's happening in all of these institutions that are teach. Oh. <laughs> indoctrination, all right, cool. Alrighty. This is basically <laughs> This is like Destiny just fighting like every single time. It's like it's like fighting on all levels, you know? Teaching <laughs> our children, teaching these people who are exiting college. Um, when you're looking at that, it, you know, it's no surprise that we've lost our sense of identity, but certainly if you are on the the train that America needs to come back together, which I recognize there are two thought processes here, and one of them is we just need a national divorce because we're too far gone, and one of them is we need to come back together, and this is how we're going to have to do it. But I would say if you are on the, uh, the team of coming back together in America, there is absolutely no way we can do it with no sense of common purpose. I would say that all of us suffer from a really bad bout of recentism. I think it's easy to feel that we have, uh, right now in this point in history, an, incredible, an incredibly unique fracture in what we would consider an American identity. But I would say that, I mean, one, there have been far worse periods of history in the United States. We literally went to war with ourselves over a fractured identity. Um, but even more importantly, I'd say, like, even in the founding principles of this country, uh, with the Federalist Papers trying to bring together the 13th colonies, um, we've always kind of had this idea of, yeah, we're Americans, but we're not all just Americans. You've got people that live in different areas. You've got a divide between religious people of different uh, factions. You've got divides between city dwellers and urban dwellers. You've got Midwesterners. You've got NFL fans. You've got, there's all these different ways that we've historically always kind of divided us. We've had slaves. We've had not slaves. We've had, um, you know, uh, Irish and Italian immigrants. We've had so many different groups of the uh, come into the United States and ultimately, hopefully, merge together. Now, I think we kind of disagree on what it means to merge. You know, we use the phrase melting pot. Uh, we have a lot of different groups here. In some ways, we're constantly, we seem to be like at strife with one another. But I, I think that part of the strength of the United States is we've always been, to some extent, pretty fractured. And I, I think that it's easy to feel, because of all of the unique problems we have lately, especially with social media, that we're in some unique point in history where our identity is fractured. Um, and I mean, aside from the Civil War, aside from internment camps in World War II, aside from uh, crazy college kids that were indoctrinated in the 60s protesting against things like the Vietnam War and civil rights, I think that we've always had a, a healthy amount of conflict in the U.S. identity. Um, I think that we can do things to, to bring it together, but I think it's important to recognize that it's not unique that we feel fractured today. Do you think, though, that it's the, the level of contempt that we have for one another, for people who disagree with us, is, is unique, that we're at a, a pretty high point of contempt? Because it's one thing to say, like, we have... We have, we're fractured, we have uh, different cultures or different opinions and, and different beliefs. But I think it's another thing to say we also view people with different opinions as morally in the wrong and we have contempt for them. Is that something that's new, do you think? 
I don't think so. I, I think that we've had, historically, there have been huge conflicts between different groups of people in the United States where we've seen, um, you know, Irish and Italian immigrants were like enemies of the U.S. or couldn't find employment in places. Uh, union versus non-union workers, especially post-civil rights era, was a huge divide in terms of how, you know, should unions be regulating themselves or should the federal government do it, a la the Civil Rights Act. Um, I think we've always had, like, some level of contempt for each other. I think that what's unique today in U.S. history is the amplification exists in a way that it never did before, which I could maybe say to some extent makes it a little unique. Because, you know, a long time ago, if I hated Joe Schmo in my neighborhood, uh, I hated Joe Schmo in my neighborhood. Maybe everybody in my neighborhood knew. If it was really bad, maybe my church knew. If it was really bad, maybe everybody in the union knew. But nowadays, the entire world can know in a heartbeat if I don't like a particular guy. And uniquely, the entire world can come down on that guy. You know, cancel culture didn't exist when news only spread as far as your newspaper traveled. Right. I can I, I would also say, I would also argue that that's why it is more fractured than in previous times, because as you said, uh, the amplification of one voice can affect so many different people that they didn't even realize that they could affect. I, I'm actually not going to disagree with him on that. I, I, like, we literally had a mini civil war over the state of Kansas. I think that we've had worse times. Wait, what? Kansas? Civil War. Mini Civil War in Kansas. Bleeding Kansas was a mini civil war between. Huh. Okay. Interesting. Didn't know that. Times and a lot of this like national divorce talk is doom and gloom. And I called it subversive nonsense on Twitter, and people got mad at me for it. But we've had divisions that are deep in this country that have led to conflict in this country. I think the thing that's different now is the way that we view the federal government. Like right now, we believe that when you elect the president it's that person's job to impose their will on the rest of the country. Like before we had more checks and balances. So you could have states that were kind of going in their own direction because you had specific roles for the federal government. And I'm pretty sure we still expected them to enforce their will. Like even back then, right? We're talking about George Washington forcing this, like through either like the Whiskey Rebellion or we talking about like Abraham Lincoln and like the force in like the Civil War or we talk about all these different aspects. Like, we acknowledge the president's going to enforce their will. We just think that, like, a lot of the way that the theory goes is, like, we think that it, like, is, is enforcing its will through a reflection of our own values. So, like, that doesn't make any sense to me, you know? And specific roles for the states. So I don't think it's as bad as it's ever been. I think that is a little bit of catastrophizing for sure. But I think the way we view national politics is worse. I think also think to that... piggyback on the back of that real quick too, I think that a lot of it becomes a numbers game with the amplification as well. Let's say for instance, I could show you every single day a new story of a horrific uh, black on white hate crime or white on black hate crime. If I could show you, you one could. story every single day, <laughs> Would that even necessarily be a bad thing? In a nation of 330 million people, you're never going to have zero problems. You're never going to have zero crime. Um, there's something called the Chinese bank robber fallacy, where I could theoretically show you a thousand new Chinese bank robberies happening every single day, in, in, uh, uh, assuming that you know we're looking at all the Chinese people across the world, and it still wouldn't necessarily make it a trend or a bad thing. It's just when you have so many numbers of people, you're bound to be able to pick and choose the types of stories you want to tell, which you can lead people into thinking that things are so much worse than they actually are. So the, the biggest division today isn't necessarily even like political in the sense of conservative, liberal, or um, you know, Republican, Democrat. The biggest thing is that we're living now in the United States through an era of regime politics. And there is, or there, there has been um, really since probably 2015, 2014. What does regime politics mean? Like, what does that even mean? Like. That's a that, that's a statement, but it had, it's baking in some language that doesn't mer inherently mean anything on its own. A level of populist sentiment on both the right and the left that has, and I think rightly, targeted this regime of, and it's it's tied to the federal government, it's tied to the president, it's also tied to Congress, it's tied to um, many many institutions throughout the government, or that you know work in hand in hand with the government, uh, the rise of essentially this administrative state. That and it was, you know, it goes back to Wilsonian um, doctrine 
this idea that universities and the academy would essentially borrow some of the sovereignty from our government and then be used to control. What? What? Wait, wait, what? Are you kidding me? Like, public universities and different institutions disagree with like the US all the time. What's that even mean? you know, the decisions of the government itself, even though they are, of course, not elected officials. This was part of the German idea that the regime should exist separate from elected government, and that's so that science and enlightenment and reason should be separated from the, you know, the muddy, grubby world of politics. And so that regime has been- But we can't. Like, literally, it's impossible to separate those two because they always, like, play off of each other, exacerbate each other, right? Our politics, our, like our own like values and our own desires are going to be indi indicative of what we're going to try and pursue as research, right? Like for a long time, our own policy was like black people are inherently inferior, so we decided to like like propose science in a way to determine like our politics are like an indication of our values. And our values are like indicated indi indicative of what we're going to try and research to some extent. But like also like we have such a diverse range of like beliefs and like values that we can like do a bunch of different research and different levels like we have from the people who disagree on sort all sorts of levels and then like we can do that research and indicate what's more generally like realistic and then we consider that right like this doesn't make any sense to me become more and more powerful it has also been amplified by many of these factors but because so many people have decided that it is not serving the people well um they're turning to candidates then and again this is both on the right and the left that are actually in opposition to that regime. Um, if you look at what happened in 2016 and then after, after that, you can see that the regime feels very threatened. This is one of the reasons that even though we had the social media amplification system, which arguably is still in place, they're doing everything they can to put the shackles and hammer down on anybody that really speaks out across these narratives. Um, when it comes to this, because the regime has the line of the regime, the inner party sets the truth, and that anything that stands in opposition to this must be rooted out. And any people, if they become rooted out uh, because of this, must also be taken down. This, of course, leads to the arrest of Julian Assange. It leads. It is some high level, like, he's trying to be really reasonable, but he's selling some conspiracy shit. It's like, we have disagreements within the parties all the time. Like, that doesn't make any sense. Like, that's because. You have, like, the dominant power. It doesn't mean, like, there isn't, like, heavy disagreement, right? Like, and they can only ultimately come to an understanding and agreement. But there are so many fundamental disagreements in the levels. It doesn't make any sense to me. It's to the current investigation on James O'Keefe. It leads to the uh, demonization of Tulsi Gabbard when she ran for president. Many of these other voices out there, and the entire anti-war movement, by the way, any of these voices, Chelsea Manning, great example, um, any of these voices, right, that come out that say, I don't like what the regime is doing are then destroyed and they must thusly be destroyed because we're living through that era so I don't necessarily think that it's all left right I mean there certainly is a lot of that but there's also a lot of this sort of up down division that we're seeing as well so uh, I want to I want to get back to this question just quickly about the level of contempt that we feel for one another as a result of all this um, I was reading a recent Brown and Stanford University study that reported that effective polarization, meaning the amount of negativity that a citizen feels towards uh, political parties other than their own, has increased dramatically in the United States in the past 40 years. And I agree with you. I think I, I don't think that it's necessarily uh, organically a political kind of division. I think that's being manufactured. But in the past 40 years, people are now reporting more contempt, more negativity towards people in the other party. So if you look at people in 1960, for example, 4% of Democrats and 4% of Republicans said they would be unhappy if their child chose to marry someone of the opposite political party. By 2019, that figure was 45% of Democrats and 35% of Republicans said they would be unhappy if their child married outside of their political party. Um, what are the factors specifically, if, if there are any factors like social media that, that are making this it's a uniquely contemptuous time for people with disagreements, what are those factors? Could we agree on what some of those are? Well, I would say that we've known for a long time, I mean, if you guys read The Righteous Mind, Jonathan Haidt's book, that it's hype, but I like to call him hate because that's how it's spelled. If you read his book, the, the, the left, like, has hated the right for a long time in this nation. 
And one of the unique things, and they've done this through surveys where like the left literally can't understand, like the further left you are, the worse you are at guessing the values of right wing people. But one of the things that's happened that's become interesting is now we have the right like hating them back. It used to be a situation where the left thought you were evil if you were on the right wing and people on the right just thought you were wrong or uh. stupid and they would try to convince you. But now we're seeing like this almost, it's finally, it's taken decades. We're seeing the right push back, and I don't know if that's due to social media. I don't know if it's oh, due to so the fact hot. that you know, for decades, these people oh, are telling you that you, that that they hate you, and you can only go for so long saying, "Oh, they're just ignorant." The or heat's now just right like, on right, top I hate of me. You back. But I, th I think the right's polarization, or their their more vitriol for the left, that 35% number is, you know, it's still lower. I but think, I think that's relatively new. I think as well, a lot of this, you know, to kind of use my theory of the regime on this, is this is fomented, right? This is fomented on both sides to uh, keep them pitted against each other to really sort of uh, occlude what is actually happening in this country right now. So you'll see or many times we've seen federal agencies or agents of national security teams go in and then implant informants in things like Black Lives Matter or other left-wing groups. You're starting to see it now in um, the... Wait, what? ...to really sort of uh, occlude what is actually happening in this country right now. So you'll see or many times we've seen federal agencies or agents of national security teams go in and then implant informants in things like Black Lives Matter or other left-wing groups. You're starting to see it now in um, the, this Boogaloo movement, which was, it seems like it was almost completely created by the federal uh, government. What the fuck are you talking about? I'm pretty sure the Boogaloo boys existed, like, without the government inter intervention. Wait, what? What? as well as people that are more associated with this is the problem with him right now is he's selling like this like even keeled conspiracy and he's trying to sell even nice even toned real chill and then yeah these militia groups these uh, three percenters oath keepers and various other groups that are associated with things that happened throughout 2020 and early 2021 and so this type of anger and polarization is fostered by the regime because they are seeking to push what's essentially known as a color revolution. Now, color revolution. What the fuck? All right. is, I've, I've heard that th word thrown around a lot. Color revolution. Describe communism related movements. The term is also implies over religions elsewhere. Such movements have a measure of success. Most all massive chief of uh Alright, what? This is a very like narrative thing, but he's not like showing any actual facts itself, you know? This is this is very much a narrative. It doesn't mean it's like yeah. Evolution is something that had you been in Eastern Europe or if you had been uh, following the, the the events of the Arab Spring, uh, you would see how different regimes or pockets. This is a problem in the analysis, though. Is our political dynamics are so split between like. Republican Democrat there's no like effective regime that can exist itself like that doesn't make any sense to me and it's so fucking stupid like what does that even mean you know of regimes or you know groupings of regimes are using these tactics to be able to achieve geopolitical primacy uh, you're seeing that we saw it in Ukraine you saw it across the Arab Spring you saw you've seen it the, really this is where the conspiracy starts filling in is he's just indicating to these but he's not indicating to the actual regime in like like, whatever he's describing regime in, like, the U.S. That doesn't make any sense you to me. Pick a country in Eastern Europe. Aren't really these dirt threats, whether filled... Like, back to me. The regime has always done... If we, if we look at it from the regime lens, I, I feel like that's an unsatisfactory explanation because the government has always done weird stuff. Whether we're talking Tuskegee with the experiments on black people and syphilis, whether we're talking the FBI informants that were embedded into people like the Black Panthers in the Civil Rights era... Um, I think the government's always been up to kind of funny business, whether we're talking about MK Ultra, there's, there's all sorts of different projects that the government has done, arguably some that have been worse in the past than what exists today. I feel like for a slightly less conspiratorial view, rather than regime versus the people, I think that something that happens, it's kind of in line, or I guess obviously I, fa I favor my paradigm, um, with the amplification of stuff, is something that's happened 
is we have become hyper-nationalized in our political landscape, and we're kind of sold this illusion that there is a unifying Democratic Party and a unifying Republican Party, and that is absolutely not true. A Democrat that exists in West Virginia has absolutely nothing in common with a Democrat, generally, that exists in, like, California. Um, and we have this issue where when we, and it doesn't surprise me that people might view each other as worse, but that's because if I were to ask, like, um, if I were to ask a Republican in any of the Bible Belt, what do you think of, um, when, you, when I say, like, Democrat? You're not actually thinking of another Democrat that might exist in your city or on your uh, state legislature or your city council or whatever. You're thinking of AOC. You're thinking of um, the Justice Dems. You're thinking of President Biden. You're thinking of Obama. And then much the same if I ask a Democrat, like, oh, well, who, who are you thinking about? You know, and they're thinking, like, you know, Jim Jordan, or they're thinking Donald Trump, or they're thinking of, you know, all of these national-level Republicans. I think that when we kind of lose, I, I think that when we look at our unique political landscapes that exist on a local level, you're going to find a lot of overlap in values. If you go to a particular city election, it's pretty rare Hello. that you're going to have an ultra-left-leaning socialist running against, like, a far-right Trump supporter. Usually there's going to be a lot of shared values in between the two of these people because that's typically how local politics works. But I think when we become so nationalized in all of these conversations, we kind of forget, like, you know, not to call anybody out, but like, who is on your state legislature, or who is your mayor, or who is your governor sometimes? People don't even know, you know? Uh, but we sure can name the last thing that AOC tweeted, or the last fight that Ben Shapiro got in with some congressperson, because the national level politics is all we see. And when that is what you see, I think because we see the most extreme of that, you tend to think that the people of the opposite political party living near you embody the values of the most extreme figures you see from halfway across the country on Twitter or television. I, I kind of want to um, add to something, Sean, that you said, um, which was, I know you said, you know, finally the right has said, I hate you back. And I do just, maybe it's semantics to some people, but to me, I, do, I would just like to, um, in, in my opinion, tweak that a little bit, which is, I think that you can only poke the bear for so long until the bear finally says, I'm done, right? So I, I, what, in what I have seen, it has not been so much that uh, you hate us and we hate you back, but it's just, we have been disrespected for so long, we have been told that we are white supremacists, that we are... <sighs> this is the problem, though, is, like, when you have, like, actual white supremacists infiltrating your party, that creates problems in the relationship. It's, like, we can understand, like, the entire party isn't full of white supremacists, but we're like, hey, those are white supremacists. And then you, like, just ignore them. They're like, no, they're not white supremacists. Like, whatever. And then you're just, like, ignoring them. You're either, like, playing for them. You're like, yo, dudes, deal with that actual issue, you know? We are this, that we are that, that we are transphobic, that we are homophobic, all of the phobics for so long that you can only live like that for so long before you turn back and say, you know what? I I'm kind of done. I just don't really care to live like this anymore. And I, I do think that it is an important distinction because I, I in my, it just in my experience, I haven't seen that hatred um, coming from the right, but more so just, okay, I'm kind of tired of this. I'm done with the energy. Uh, I just I'm tired of calling, being called a white supremacist, so I'm gonna be called white supremacist. <laughs> just don't wanna play the game anymore. Oh, for sure. And I do think a big driving factor is the emphasis on racial politics. Mm -hmm. Obviously, Destiny just looks so dead inside. He's just like, please murder me. <laughs> race is very divisive. And no matter what most people say about how they don't mind being called racist at this point, it's something that bothers you because that's one of the worst things to call somebody. It's close. It, the, the closest thing to it is calling somebody a pedophile. Like, that's how serious the allegation is. So ever since we've, like, the left has really, and you could track their mentions of white supremacy on Google Trends. Ever since they've like ratcheted up that rhetoric, we've seen the response from the Republicans because they were always nasty. They always like hated George W. Bush. They Destiny is just like, please just murder me. <laughs> uh, this is so stupid because it's just like, yo, dudes, like this has been an actual problem. And then like you, we start to point out the problem and they're like, yeah, fucking mask off. Let's go. <laughs> they would call him an idiot. They hated Sarah Palin and all that. But we're like, whatever, that's politics. Like, you know, we understand. We don't like Hillary Clinton because she kills people. Like, we, we get it. Like, but once everybody became, like, deplorable white supremacists and all that, you just see this everywhere. And it, it's not the full left. Like, you know, progressives make up, like, 7% of the population. And, like, these are the people most likely to be ratcheting it up. But people just fall in line and they comply with that loud 7%. And I think that's led to the right seeing the left as that and realizing that even if I know intellectually you don't hate me on the left, 
you're willing to stand idle while my name gets dragged through the mud or my family's members' names get dragged through the mud because you're not willing to call it out because we've like glorified the allegations of racism in this country. So I do think that has led, to, you know, that is the poking of the bear and that's where we went too far or they went too far. We would, we would also probably be remiss or I would probably be remiss if we didn't bring up the, the one F area. I just want to see Destiny say something. Specific people now vaccinated to news is one per second. We are this year and we're all and it to comment idea that um, someone had said, well, true patriots, we hear that so do and not patriot activists somehow he is as so We literally had it. I think it's a really dangerous time. I think we've absolutely been collectivists in the past. We literally had a draft where we forced young men who were 18 years old to go overseas and fight to the death in wars. I would say that we definitely, we had an office of censorship around World War II, where we were literally disallowing people casting baseball games to talk about the weather because we didn't want, uh, you know, foreign enemies to have any, any sort of information coming into the United States. I think that there's always been like a healthy balance between, uh, you know, like these are our private liberties, but as we tell our children with, you know, more uh, freedoms comes more responsibilities. You know, you want to drive, that's fine. You can't drink and drive. Um, if you want to, you know, stay out late, that's fine, but you've got to call and check in. Like it's always been historically, whether we're talking to our children or our fellow countrymen, that with a additional freedoms is always necessarily going to come additional responsibilities because you just can't have a, an anarchy, an anarchist society with everybody running around doing as they will and saying we have freedom, we have freedom because freedom is really only as good as, as the people around you ensure it is, you know, like you can have an ultimately free society that at the end of the day you don't have the ability to do anything inside. So whether that's a pandemic and you're immunocompromised and now you can't go anywhere because nobody wants to do anything to, uh, you know, take care of themselves or take care of you to make sure that you don't get sick or, you know, whether that's, you know, driving on the road and other people are drunk driving because we decide, well, you know, they can drunk drive, but if they get an accident, that's what we're going to punish them. I think that we always accept some level of limits on our freedom. If we want to say also that there's like a two-tier system being created between the vaccinated and the non-vaccinated, I mean, I guess we can say that, but that system was created a long time ago. We've had that for a long time. In order to go to public schools, and most that's private That's not true. That's completely not true. Wait, do you require vaccinations to attend most schools? Did, you, did they check a vaccination status when we got into this theater, when you went to a supermarket? When you went to I would argue going to school everywhere. is more important than going to the theater. Or there are also, no, 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 there are no, no, also, no, no, there are, but, most but, states but have this exemptions. Is Mott and this is Mott and Bailey, right? This is, we're not talking about those vaccines. We're talking about this vaccine. And I, I mean, I'm just saying, if you to, to utter the phrase, we're creating a two-tier system between the vaccinated and the unvaccinated, that's already existed. No, no, but I mean, there's, absolutely, there's a crucial it really distinction. Doesn't. It's actually it, happening. Absolutely. You cannot go to public schools and most private schools unless you are vaccinated, and you have to show a record of that. Right, so right, but I, I'd like to just, I'd like to just correct, but, but on top of that, most states in this country offer a wide variety of exemptions for parents to fill out. I know because I do them. It's very easy. I go to my state. Oh, that's, oh, she's like, oh, I get the, <laughs> yeah, she, she likes to fill out those, uh, she likes to fill out those, uh, exemptions, you know? Um, okay. So she basically saying is like, we have exemptions. Yeah. We have exemptions for immunocompromised. Cool doesn't mean we allow them you know like we have exceptions and we make exceptions because they're like actual like demonstrable things but like for the most part we say like hey you have to do this you know it's uh registrar the department of uh of health i go fill out my information they send me a form i go get it notarized saying i don't want my children to be vaccinated for whatever reason i so choose my personal conscience i believe that it's new york and california who are the only ones who have done away with everything except medical but medical still remains so the idea that i can't send my kids to public school or private school unless they're vaccinated is absolutely untrue i know because i do it there's an exemption do, process, do though, you, my understanding, you, for the for the COVID-19 vaccine as well, though. Yes, you are allowed to get tested, and you can show that you've been many, tested. Many, many employers are not though. accepting that yeah, no. exemption. <laughs> but I have, a, I have a question. Do you believe, Stephen, that there's no, you don't believe that there's an attempt to use vaccine status uh, to divide us in this country? That's not... You don't think that's I think happening? at this point, you could literally tell people to stop shitting in the streets and Republicans will pull down their pants and run up and down but, and do it. I think that people are looking for divisions in any possible place you can find it. Um, like... I guess as an American citizen, I think that we have access to a wonderful society, but there's going to be some buy-in to that society. Whether it triggers people or not, like paying taxes is part of your obligation to society. Or being a good neighbor is part of your obligation to society. Taking the bare minimum steps to ensure that you're not transmitting a deadly disease over and over and over again to other people is like the bare minimum step you can take in society. I, well, I think it's a fair... Yeah, but what does being there's, a good neighbor mean, though? That means different things to different people, right? Like when you're well, saying... Of course, and that's what we but vote when on. You're, but when you're saying 
it's my responsibility, public health is my responsibility, it is not my responsibility that we have an obesity crisis in this nation. I have not forced people to go. Can you can you become obese through vaccine? If you, can 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 somebody make you obese if you're obese? Can can you become obese if somebody else is obese? No, this is stupid. Obesity is not contagious. No, but no, it but, makes but, people but, more prone to getting COVID. That's which fine, means but that which, so if you but if it's you a, but if you have made yourself have comorbidities to something that is going around, how is that my responsibility? I mean, we can talk about reasonable steps you can take to prevent one from getting sick. I don't know if I would say that, like, every single but person has to live. Right. Right. People right. don't take care of their own bodies. Say, I don't think we can say every single person has to live an optimally healthy life. Otherwise, it's your responsibility. Right, but that wasn't but when your argument. Like when it comes to something like a vaccine, when it comes to something like a vaccine. By the way, can you guys see why I brought up vaccines? Because, like, this was kind of, you know, we were kind of, like, just chilling up here. And then I was like, let's talk about something spicy. He wanted to make it interesting. Actually, this, I think, goes like Yeah, because you're fucking stupid, dude. We are going to now speak of the vaccine. We are going to have a lively argument discussion for your viewing pleasure oh fucking hell man <laughs> this guy's actually insane suddenly it's very contentious N yeah okay? I, I do have and a point about that because you brought up you brought up the uh, in order to go to public schools and true we require most kids there are exceptions to get vaccinated for public schools but what do we require them to get vaccinated for diseases that are either more contagious than covid and diseases that are more deadly for children than COVID. Like we don't require flu shots every year for kids to go to public schools. And COVID for kids in that age is about as dangerous as the flu. Nor like did we want require- No, it's not. It's more dangerous. Shut the fuck up. Compare yes. this to a smallpox vaccine. Smallpox's fatality rate was 30%. It was a worldwide pandemic, like or a worldwide plague on humanity. It's not a- it's not an issue now, right? You purposely keep the vaccines going to make sure they don't become worse issues. Like, what the fuck are you talking about? These two things are not comparable, so... I agree that we don't require flu shots, but if the flu was killing, you know, 500,000 people in the a year... The flu kills it more does. children than... Wait, hold on, than hold on. The, flu does, the flu fatality rates are nowhere near the SARS-CoV-2. He's talking about for children. We're talking about flu. children because yeah. sure. you brought but, up schools. But, we're not, but you don't get vaccinated just for children. I don't know why conservatives are so short-sighted when it comes to public health. You don't get shot just for the children. You get shot to protect their families, to protect their teachers, to protect other people in society. <laughs> this, is what, this is how vaccinations work. Vaccinations are not an individual protection measure. But, it is a societal epi uh, epidemiological though. health just, prescription. Just to That's get us back work. on subject for a second. So, so they they I, are I, <laughs> I'm curious, you, because we all seem to be, at least I thought we were in agreement on several things until we got to this very divisive issue of Psych. vaccines. <laughs> um, but I'm, I'm just curious, do you believe that there's a concerted effort in this country to divide the populace along issues like race, for example, using race, for example, to divide us, using the vaccine to divide us, using uh, partisanship, you know. I mean, I think the division is a byproduct of other goals. I don't think the goal is explicitly like we're going to divide with this issue and focus on it. I think that people have issues that they care about a lot and then they and then people end up being divided on it. So whether we're talking about people on the left dividing people with the coronavirus or Republicans dividing people with abortion, I don't think anybody's goal is to divide somebody with a topic. It's just you have things you care a lot about and then you push it and those topics end up becoming divisive because people disagree with them. Yeah, that's fair. Look, I think people's <laughs> uninformed nature leads to bad policy and authoritarian policy. We've seen the polling that a bunch of people in this country think that the hospitalization rate for COVID-19 is over 50%, over 30%. Uh, it doesn't matter what they think it is. It matters what it is. We have numbers to go to, and it actually is. So, like, people think that COVID sends you to the hospital like smallpox. I understand why they're pressuring their governments to pass regulations there was, to um, treat it like smallpox. R Russ Doe had, had a, a column in the New York Times where he was saying that, um, you know, what, what if COVID was 10 times more deadly? And, and my response was like, well, yeah, then I'd be there with you, right? Mm -hmm. You know, that I would understand some of this stuff and we could take those steps, right? If it was as deadly as smallpox, then yes, certainly we would, we would be using much dr more drastic measures. But, you know, when it comes to this, I find it very interesting that we argue more about the... Uh... All right, here we go. Smallpox, death rate in 2019. 
Jesus. Don't want to look at that. Nope. Okay, I I can't. Nope. This is really stupid to me, honestly. <clears throat> like, smallpox doesn't kill a whole lot of people today, but we keep it there because it's, like, dangerous. COVID is absolutely dangerous. It's less dangerous because we have better, like, infrastructure now, but that's so stupid of an argument. The effects of the steps that we're going to be taking on this, rather than, you know, for me, I've been a big, you know, proponent of understanding where COVID came from, understanding this process, the change process, and... I'm gonna fucking Roblox myself. This is so stupid of an argument. Looking into, you know, early January 2020, I was like one of the first guys in the country who was reading the Mandarin on uh, various Chinese blogs, trying to figure out what the heck was going on in Wuhan, and then digging into the lab and everything else. And it's it's amazing to me. Oh, he's so fucking stupid. How that, which really <sighs> seems like something the country could unite on, and I don't mean to. This is why I can't go agree with like majority of the right. It's because of this stupid shit right here. It's like it's just conspiracy after conspiracy nowadays, and it's like we can talk about dynamics of power structures and infrastructures that make it easier for authoritarian actions to occur. But you would have to guarantee that this is a author. This is what's happening right now, right? Just because it makes it easier for things to occur, it doesn't mean it's going to be constant, right? That's the problem in the. And the argument is it's so short-sighted. It's like, you can talk about how, like, there's an impetus to drive towards authoritarianism because it's just, like, whatever. But, like, you'd have to make the argument that this is occurring right now. This is authoritarianism, you know? Like, this is so to stupid. Drive the conversation into this that has been completely usurped by instead, no, 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 we're going to have these divisive mandates. And it's amazing to me that when I see Joe Biden, he, every time he announces a mandate, it's because he's trying to distract from something that's just happened. So Afghanistan falls apart. He announces he's going to push nationwide mandates. Then uh, he has a political loss. He's suffering. <sighs> just because something's occurring doesn't mean the president's trying to, like, distract from it. Like, that's such a stupid argument to make. Badly in the poll Can you, like, indicate that that's an actual thing? Can you indicate that's his thought process? Can you indicate, like... You're just like, <laughs> sorry. <coughs> oh, I had some acid reflux. Just because you think that's a thing doesn't mean it's a, a, an actual thing. That's so stupid. Polls, he announces that OSHA is going to fund, just this last week, right, is going to push the new rule. 40 pages, thing comes out, everyone's going to be fined. And so everybody then goes and talks about the mandates. The same time you're seeing um, the uh, ordering of vaccinations for children in New York State. And so it's it, looking at it again, like, because I do look at everything through the regime, not everything, but I look at a lot of this through the politics of, or the lens of regime politics, that you can really see that <clears throat> a lot of what the regime, and, and to your point, you know, I do think that this is something that a lot of people care about, but I can see that the way that the timing of these orders is really. Be oh, this is so stupid. Just because something happens in, like, tandem after something doesn't mean, like, it's like they're purposely uh, this is so stupid being pushed to help and benefit that i am supposed to uh things who gets away uh, that I, I there's just no they're just absolute. stupid i wouldn't want to oh my stress i mean you can play that on both sides though maybe you think you don't want to put your child i wouldn't want to put my child at risk being in a classroom with your child i don't want my child to contract something so then they stay might home i don't then no, stay you, home no, but your child is the problem not mine because it's i'm willing not, for though. my child to you take can't the minimum spread a virus that you don't necessary. have i'm willing to have my child take the minimum steps necessary to make sure that they're safe and they protect their classmates as well i'm guessing you're probably against children wearing masks too or other types of <laughs> yes i am yeah so you're it's abusive so, so you it's are, abusive yeah, so but the problem is my is child never wore a mask if my my child catches something or gets something because another student isn't taking the minimum preventative <coughs> risks and we know that children are pretty tenacious when it comes to the coronavirus they're probably not going to die they're probably not even going to get seriously ill but if they bring that home to grandma and grandpa and now grandma and grandpa died because you decided to fill out a bullshit exemption for your kid because you didn't want them to get a vaccination because of a stranger in a supermarket uh -huh. that's just absolutely absurd okay so so hold on so hold on so hold on so here's the thing so here's the thing um it's if your mask works 
if your vaccine works, if your child vaccine works, you shouldn't have to worry about my child. What? My is child is not a threat is, to you. I, do, I don't. If you believe in your science, then believe in your science. I'm, you're I fine. <laughs> this is so stupid. It's like, because you're not getting vaccinated, you make the spread of COVID worse and you're going to like, like cause more harm as like more variants develop and shit. Like, this is such a stupid argument. And me. if you Can don't, I, and you're worried about my child, I what cannot, does that say? I cannot understand how conservatives are so <laughs> bad with probability. Absolutely blows my mind. Why if you, if, you if, you, if your seatbelt works, why do you have an airbag? If your airbag works, why does your car crumple? If this all works, why do you care about other drunk drivers? Like, no, no, you can make that's the dumbest that's, one that's, in the world, but this, at every single that's thing not that at all do, a great analogy. is completely one-to-one -one in comparison. The things that you do epidemiologically is not to, we're gonna do this one thing in 100% the virus and if we don't it's a failure it's all the little steps that you take on the way if everybody social mm -hmm. distance and mask you prevent the spread this much if everybody did that and that and then got vaccinated you prevent it this much if everybody stays on you this is how it works all of it is probabilistic this idea that well you've got something that increases your probability by this percent so now nobody has anything it's the dumbest look at it. so, so if you if you are living in a free society if you choose to live in a free society and you choose to go into society, you are accepting the risk that you will get a transmissible disease every time you exit your home. That is how a free society works. You will never vaccinate every virus out of the population. You will always have sickness and we will always transmit diseases because that's just the way a free society works. So if you are... Yes, but if you live in a free society, you understand in order to help maximize your freedom, you don't want the spread of diseases. So you, as a member of like society, choose to take these actions to prevent the spread of these diseases so you don't harm the others in your society. Your own freedoms don't... Your freedoms stop when they hurt others. Like, this is so stupid. Worried about what everyone else is... is transmitting you are the one who should stay at home so because we how live, we've always we lived we've always transmitted flu at the supermarket no one's been worried about that so we we've always we transmitted diseases we don't no one's a, been worried we don't live about in a free society we live in a democratically elected representative government so if most of the public decides that these mandates are indeed necessary for you to participate no. in society then you are the one that is going to have to abide by what the public so what is the majority that is how that. our government works that's how our Let system works we're in a democratically no, elected it, public that's how do you define how do you define Rights. I, I'd, I'd like to know how you define rights. Like where, and and I, this will actually get us back on topic a little bit. Where do rights come from? Because this, it a, sounds there's to a, me... There's a whole other conversation on do we believe rights come from God? Do we believe they come from government? Do we talk about positive rights? But it rights sounds to me rights? like you're saying it's within your right for the majority to dictate force against others. So, for example, if the majority of, of people say we should enslave people... Then we should enslave people. So Is we that can what have, we can have, we have, and we have etched out in our constitution. There are going to be minimums, or there are going to be certain inalienable rights that we cannot take from other people, and that's up to the, I guess, the courts to decide for autonomy? us to change uh, the constitution. Yeah. Otherwise, right? You can say by the time you want, but vaccinations are required for children going to public schools, yeah, right? What we it, it, we the, discussed that. The point that, is, like is that rights exist on on paper. Okay, it doesn't matter what right we talk about if we can't leave our house because we're worried about something, or if we can't. Go, now, I'm not saying that the coronavirus is choice. so bad that you can never leave the house. House. I'm just saying that in order for society to function, we don't all work in this ultimately free way. We have a responsibility to other people. Conservatives should understand this the best because cons conservatives are the most local people that tend to participate locally in their churches, in their charities. They give more than liberals do. You guys should know this better than anyone else and that in order for society to function, to be well lubricated, to not have a lot of friction, you have to have some minimum level of buy-in in terms of how you treat the people around you. One of the ways you treat people nice is by not volunteering as a bioterrorism <laughs> weapon because you don't want to get vaccinated Look. because of some that fucking Anderson Cooper said on CNN. For someone who, for someone who claims, for someone who claims that conservatives have a hard time believing in science, you seem to not understand the idea that no one can spread a virus that they don't have. And also, my rights aren't. I, so I'm not a bioterrorist weapon by going to the grocery store if I don't have a virus. You, your you assumption, every day to know, wait, I don't your assumption that everyone else you come into contact with, if they are not vaccinated, must have COVID, no, they is don't ridiculous. Must, but there's an increased probability. No, That's no, no. How it but works. like, my, my rights are not subject. <laughs> uh, this is so stupid. Uh, I hate, I hate her so much. I hate him. I hate her. I hate Sean. He's stupid. He's a fucking dumb fuck. To your inability to assess risk properly. You're talking about people afraid to leave their homes because of the coronavirus. I literally You're talking about children uh, being afraid to go to school or parents afraid for their children to go to all school. All right. Yeah, we're done with this. Basically, the argument goes is the base of this is uh, destiny fighting off every other dumb fuck in the world. Okay. That is the that is the world of that is the world here. So, yeah. <laughs> oh, that is so annoying.